sure that hey everybody so welcome back to another episode of the creative collective uh we're here today with joe kovacevic and uh i'm gonna tell you right now i've been chomping at the bit for this one right it, it, this one guys is gonna blow your mind right it, he he makes something that is difficult right when you first find out about it hear about it he makes it sound like it's i mean nothing to it right super easy he is the absolute man that you want to know and uh, we're going to get ready to take your business to the next level i promise right so joe kvasevic welcome to the creative collective thank you very much it's uh an honor to be here to answer your questions yeah absolutely so kind of as we always do guys we're gonna start out by just finding out a little bit about joe right he's got a he's one of the guys that i really uh, love because i come from a humble humble beginnings a, a humble background and uh and he's he's very much that guy right and and um i would say self-taught right joe you you're self-taught right yep yeah for the so, most part yep blue collar guy that ended up self-taught but the story is for Joe to tell. So Joe, let's take it back to as far back as you want to go, right? When when little Joe was running around in the in the front yard, where do you come <laughs> from? Uh, how how did you grow up? You know what what got you from the the beginning to here? All right. Well, when I grew up, I grew up in the uh, suburbs of Buffalo, uh, Boston, and uh, Orchard Park. That's suburbs of the Buffalo area, and then uh, graduated from Orchard Park High School and uh, went on to college, got a degree in pre-med. I was going to go become a uh, physician's assistant and uh, decided that I really didn't really want to go to college anymore. So I answered the ad in the paper at uh, 22 years old to go on the railroad, and I was hired. But uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about getting hired so you answer the end of the paper and you get a call back to go to that Howard Johnson you know and you go into that room and you know there's like 60 people in the room and I'm looking around and this guy's in a tie and a suit and these guys are bringing in briefcases and I'm like oh my god I look at myself I got a flannel a t-shirt a Carhartt jeans and still told work boots. I'm like, oh, am I in the wrong place? I don't know if this is going to happen. Well, after about 10 minutes, everybody settled down and they said, hi, welcome to come in. And here comes this guy. Oh, we'd like this road foreman to come in and speak with you. I'm like, I don't even know what a road foreman is. And he says, hi, how are you? Uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you a little bit about the railroad and all of a sudden, he said, "You're not gonna see little Johnny's birthday. You're not gonna. You're not gonna open up any presents on Christmas. It'll be two days. You're gonna be in Selkirk, or you're gonna be in Willard, and you're not gonna see your family for two, three days at a time. You're gonna be living in a different state. We're gonna own you. You're you. As soon as you step foot on property, we're gonna. We have you for twelve hours, not eight. It's twelve. And I'm just looking around and everybody's, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. After his speech, he says, okay, well, for everybody in the room, we're going to take a little five to 10 minute break. And if you don't like what I said, please excuse yourself. Well, let me tell you, everybody jumped up, grabbed their papers, threw it in the briefcase and they ran out of the room. I'm looking around after everybody keeps on going and going. I'm like, boy, should I go or should I stay? I stayed. There was about 15 of us, 20 of us at the end. And he's like, well, he came back and he says, okay, now we got rid of the riffraff. Now we can take a test. So now I had to take a test too. <laughs> so I took a test and passed the test. And well, I didn't know I passed the test. He said, I'm going to go outside. And if I call your name, come outside. So we called another eight people's names. And there was like six of us left. And he's like, okay, you guys made it. So, I mean, I was shaking for, you know, the whole hour waiting. So I finally get hired out on the railroad and after a few years you know saved up a few bucks you know I'm, I'm i'm a conductor and well let's get into real estate so my first 
real estate purchase was in 2000. Hired out in 98. And my first real estate purchase was in 2000. It was it was land, just eight and a half acres. Still have it till today. Still have it. And uh, then I started growing and buying a townhouse. And then I, I, met a, I met a girl and now we're eight years down the road. And now it's 2009 and I buy a duplex and she's bringing in a house and I have the townhouse that's rented out. And now we have another duplex. So now I buy another townhouse. So now we're up to like nine doors. So, hey, look at that. I'm a, I'm a landlord. Wow, that's cool. Well, there's a lot of ups and downs with being a rent landlord. So after the one guy came in and tore the one place apart, I had to put it back together. That wasn't too fun. But, uh, you know, you learn, you learn. I learned how to tile. 18, 18, uh, 18's on a diamond, right? That's how I learned how to dial the whole, the, the whole first floor, right? 1,200 square foot. How do I tile? I don't know. You know how many I broke? Every one I broke was like $6.50. I'm like, no. Yeah, that was, that was an expensive lesson. But you know what? It, I learned, I learned. And, and that's, that's the part of it. So you, when you learn, when you, when you mess up, you learn and you grow. So mm -hmm. as, uh, as time went on, and then we bought another house to live in for our primary in 2010. And uh, I was looking, I was looking at the, uh, the mortgage for the, for the duplex. And it was like, you know, I'm making 14 on one side and 12 on the other. And the mortgage, the mortgage is, is like 2000, 2200, right? And I'm like, well, there's only $200 in cash flow here. This don't make sense. Uh, you know, I thought I was doing well with a, uh, you know, biweekly mortgage and only 15 years. Oh yeah, let's, let's hammer it and get it done. And um, well, as, as things moved on, I'm like, what is this amortization? And I'm living in the house and I, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. What? Well, it's only 3%. Why am I paying so much? And uh, I learned that amortization was nothing more than devil's arithmetic, if you will. What the bank does is they dial down the velocity of how you pay your mortgage. And I, at this time, said, well, I have enough equity in my house, 175000 to take a HELOC out and put it down on the duplex. So I did, paid off the duplex. And now I have a HELOC, which is 3%, same as the mortgage, but it's simple interest. Well, what's the difference between simple interest and amortization? You only pay for what you use. Oh my goodness. So now I have the left side, the right side, my paycheck and the wife's paycheck, and I'm putting it into the HELOC. Well, you wanna know how quick that principal went down? And then I, paid the electric bill, the gas bill, and my mortgage out of the HELOC. I turned it into a one-pot system. It was my savings account, my checking account, and my investment account all in one. Well, two and a half, late, two and a half years later, what happened? I now have 175 paid off with that duplex. And I'm like, wow, if I did that, I wonder what I could do with the other house. So I went back to the bank and I increased my 175 HELOC to a $400,000 HELOC. Paid off the mortgage with my primary house again in another two and a half years. 2013 comes along and I have a $400,000 HELOC that's ready to be used. Hey, I'm gonna become a private money lender. So I start lending out the money. 2016 comes along and the, uh, the union says to me, hey, do you wanna work in the railroad anymore? Or do you want to make a move to Rochester? I was a yard master at the time. So I was making a good wage over 2000 a month or 2000 a week. And uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I went out. So I made a move to Rochester in December of, uh, or January 1st of 2017. I received a uh, letter saying that the yard closed and I didn't have to make a move because it was too far to go to Buffalo. So I, uh, I took the addendum. I took my, my pay and uh, walked away from the railroad, gave away my, my, uh, my rights. I'll get my pension, you know, it's 62 or whatever, but I don't collect anything till that. And uh, then I got a landscaping business, snow plowing, and uh, was kept on money lending. And then 
two years later, I'm, I'm flipping houses also now too and doing um, townhouses and, and, and flipping duplexes and single families. And I go down to a home show and I meet this guy. March of 2018 in a home show. Chris Noggle is his name. And he's Flip Out Academy. Hey, why don't you learn how to flip houses? And I'm like, hey, I'm a flipper. He's like, really? Oh, cool. So I show him the phone and we get to talking and he's like, you got to become the bank. And I'm like, oh, all right, well, let's work on that. So a few months goes by and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm think I'm going to go talk to him. So I did. And uh, <laughs> after 17 minutes of being with him, he throws this piece of paper in front of me, perfect loan proposal. And I said, what's this? He says, well, this is a house that I want to flip. It's uh, $225,000. I'm like, oh, really? Well, I have to go pick up my daughter at school. He's like, yeah, sure you do. I'm like, no, 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 really. I'll be back. Yeah, sure you will. Oh, okay. So I leave two and a half hours later. I, I come back with a $225,000 blank check. Where'd that come from? My HELOC. So I gave it to him. He says, who are you? I says, I'm Joe. I'm, I'm here to make money. And he's like, awesome. So we got into business and I started becoming his private money lender then. And uh, if you ever want to know how to make free money, that's kind of the way to do it. The bank puts money into an account. You write a check for 225 to the borrower. The borrower will give you money per month. That money pays the HELOC and say there's money left over in your hand. They do it for six, seven, eight, ten 10 months. That HELOC gets paid by the borrower and you're left with $10,000 in your hand. Didn't cost you anything because they paid for the HELOC and you were left with money in your hand. So that's what I started and that's what I was doing. And now I'm doing Velocity Banking since 2010 and incorporating this. As of today, now we're at 14 years of doing Velocity Banking. And in uh, 2019, he says, uh, hey, you need to know about IBC. I'm like, IBC, what's that? That's the infinite banking concept. It'd become your own bank. I'm like, well, I got to see more about it. So I talked to a guy named Brent, Brent Kessler, and, uh, and Chris Noggle. And they were uh, trying to teach me about the infinite banking concept. Well, I thought it was all about numbers. But as I realized over time, I had three notebooks, two calculators, and I'm trying to figure out what's the IRR, what's this, what's that, what's the percentage. You can't figure it out. I had a real life event happen. That real life event was my wife wanting a vehicle. So May of 2019, she wanted a XT5 Cadillac. So I went to the car dealership and, uh, did the deal and worked with the manager and got the car. So he's walking me out and he says that I had an avalanche. Oh, pearl white avalanche. Oh, that looks nice. I'm like, Rob, don't even think about it. He's like, oh, come on, Joe, humor me. Go sit in that Escalade. So I sat in the Escalade. You know what I did, right? Yeah, I bought the Escalade too. But it's not over. On the way home, I was driving on the thruway and I called up my mom and I said, Ma, you're never going to believe what I just did. She says, you bought Katina that, Esco that that car, didn't you? And I says, I did, but I also bought myself an Escalade, too. She goes, you bought two cars? I'm like, yeah. You know what she said? I want one, too. I'm like, what? So <laughs> I'm like, which one do you want? She goes, oh, I want the little one, the XT4. I'm like, all right. Well, I think this is the 17th, actually, of, of, uh, of, of uh, March. Anyway, it was a Tuesday. So uh, I bought an XT4, XT5, and an Escalade on, on Tuesday. So Friday comes along, and the cars are all ready for us, and, and the wife drives uh, the H3 Hummer over there, and I'm driving the Avalanche, and I, I got to stop at the bank, right? I, I got to get a cashier's check. So I got to get a check for $148,767.32. All right. So I get it, and it's in my pocket, and off we go. So we're sitting in front of the front of Rocco that was a sales guy and uh, he says well the cars are all set and the paperwork's all ready do you have the check and I says I do and I puffed out my chest because I paid cash for my vehicles and I scooched to the edge of the seat and I ripped took the, the check out of my pocket and crisped it up and rolled it on the side of the table to make it nice and straight and 
I handed it over to the table to him. And as he grabbed the check and pulled, I pulled. And then he pulled. And I pulled. And I started shaking. I started standing up. I'm going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. My wife thought I was having a stroke. Everybody in the place is looking at me. I'm going, oh, my God. I don't believe it. I grabbed her by the shoulders. I looked her in the face and I said, if I would have taken this 150000 put it into the policy, I would have been able to borrow it out, buy these vehicles, and still make money on my money. That right there was when the light bulb went off. Not when I went to the bank. Not when I was driving there. But as he already had taken the 150000 so, so much to unpack there. I love it's that just, story, by the way. It's so funny. It's an amazing story. Right? Right? And, and there's so much to unpack, right? Because when you're talking to all of the other people in the room, we all, we, I think we all as investors or entrepreneurs have this epiphany moment, right? When you, when you find out that working that W-2 job is depriving you of 40 hours a week that you can get back and put into something else, right? And then once you make that decision to dive head first into that thing, right? The light bulb just goes off. So that is an amazing story. I, I mean, that's all that you can really say about that. I mean, it's, it's absolutely crazy, right? <laughs> so, all right. So, all of these things have happened. We've grown up. We've gone through um, the job with the railroad. We've gone through private money lending. I do want to ask you a couple of questions about that. But then the light bulb moment goes off, epiphany moment. <clears throat> I have, as Justin, and I'm sure maybe others, you know, I, I always talk about those fail forward moments where you get you're doing private money lending, you start out, you don't really know exactly what you're doing, or, or maybe you do kind of know, but you know, there are the scammers and those things that are out there and you fall into the deal that you should not be in. How did you learn about that, right, Joe? Because now that I've known you, I, I know, you know, kind of some of what you're doing, in the, in, well, a little bit of what you're doing in that private money lending space, but you know, how are you vetting these people? How are you making sure that you're secure? First and foremost, collateral is the name of the game. I will not lend on anything that I'm second. I'm only going to lend on stuff that I'm first position, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the network that we're in with uh, the money school. We have forklifts, you know, there's a guy that purchases forklifts and they're dilapidated and old and rusty and the tires are bald and they come into the shop and that's when an investor says, okay, well, I'll purchase that for invoice. And it goes around the shop and gets a new seat and a new wheel and new, new uh, paint job and sandblasted and stickers. And, and then he sells it and there's a split of 60 to 40. So that, that helps one of, uh, you know, the, the ways that it is because that's my forklift as it goes around the shop. Uh, we also have uh, semis. Semis, there's a, there's a guy, an investor that uh, is helping out these truck drivers who are leasing vehicles. And the only person that's making out there is the actual leasing company. Uh, half of their paycheck is going to them. And uh, now we're getting investors to do bridge loans, if you will. So he's buying semis and now the bridge investors are being first lien holder on the semi and the, um, the driver is getting their credit score high enough so that they can refinance this vehicle from the investor and uh, become an owner occupant of, of, of their semi, which is quite valuable to that person because now they're increasing their livelihood and they're making more money and they're getting out of credit card debt and now they're looking at houses. So that's kind of the next division where the semis are going to be going to, to uh, real estate next also. But uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of a high percentage um, around 72%. Like, and I love that. We, we obviously know who that investor is and we've talked a little bit with him. Amazingly smart guy. Um, yeah. 
And one of the cool things is, well, the, the thing that Joe is doing here, right, with infinite banking is it, you, you see how it, 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 it causes this exponential growth, right? You're making money on the deal of the, as a lender. Now you're putting somebody into a job. That person's now getting money and he's ready to go out and start looking for a house. And we've been talking with that same investor about wrap deals on those houses to get those guys, um, you know, in, into homes, right? Because these blue collar guys deserve that, right? They work hard. They deserve that. They, sh they should be able to live out that dream. So, man, I, again, amazing. I, I want, I just wanted people to know and realize, right, when, when you're going out and you're looking at these deals um, to make sure that you're safe, right, to make sure that your position is secure, to make sure that you're lending on the right deals. I've heard more than a few horror stories. So, uh, as I say, I've, I've lost $57,000 between me and another investor to a guy. And it was a rough learning experience, right? And so it's good to surround yourself with people like Joe so that you can find out the things that you're doing wrong and correct them, right? <laughs> so yeah. that you get into the right things. So well, when, somebody said, climbs, when somebody climbs the ladder, you should listen to them because, you know, they've fallen already three, four times. And uh, there's no reason why, you know, somebody... Somebody can listen to other person and they might actually skip a few runs along the way. Right. But what happens with my strategy sessions? Yeah. yeah. Don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> do not just, reinvent the wheel. Just, yeah. Just do what he's doing. So that like, being follow said, the leader. <laughs> that, that being said, you know, people have now a little bit of a gauge for how you got here, how the infinite banking is kind of working, but now let's go into that Joe, right? Because right. Hey, get ready, guys. He, he's getting ready to, to unpack a wealth of knowledge here on you, right? But let's really talk about infinite banking concept. Let's understand what this is. All right. I can do that. You want to go on a little journey with me? I love that. All right. Let's, let's do that. So we, I'm going to explain it because most people know how banks work and they know that they can borrow and, and loan and, and that kind of thing. So Let's let's talk in a in a realm of uh, of a little journey like right now. So, all right, Demi. So you and I, we're gonna walk into Bank of America, all right, and and you're gonna have a hundred thousand dollars in your hand, and you're gonna want to deposit that at Bank of America. So we take the hundred thousand, we walk up to the counter, and we talk to Jessica. We say, Jessica, Demi would like to deposit this hundred thousand dollars with you. What is the interest rate? She says, oh, today it's 6%. It says, okay, beautiful. Uh, here's the 100,000. Can we have a receipt? So she hands us a receipt. And then you and I, we, we walk out of Bank of America. We walk down the sidewalk, 10 steps. I open the next door and we walk into Chase Bank. Well, we walk into Chase Bank and we walk up to the counter and there's Wendy. We say, Wendy, Damon just deposited $100,000 next door at Bank of America. Here's the receipt. Can you use that account as collateral? Because we would like to borrow 50,000 from you. She says, sure, Joe, we can use that account as collateral. And uh, if you borrow the 50,000, it'll be 4% interest. I said, beautiful. So she hands Damon the $50,000 and we walk out of Chase Bank. So I tell Damon, I says, this is, what, this is the money that you're going to spend throughout the next year. So you spend the money, the 50,000, and 366 days later, we walk into Bank of America. Well, we deposited $100,000 at 6%. So they're going to give you an interest check for $6,000, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we borrowed 50,000 from Chase at 4%. We have to pay them for using that money. So that bill is going to be 2,000, correct? Right. Well, if you made six thousand with your deposit at Bank of America, and we borrowed fifty from Chase and had to pay them for using it, two thousand. Did you not make four thousand dollars and do absolutely you nothing? You did. Okay. Well, that's A. Question B: Whose money did you use throughout the year? Bank did of you America. Use 
you use oh, Chase's Chase, money. Chase, Chase, Chase. Bank, you use sorry. Chase's money. All right. Well, if you use Chase's money, didn't you deposit every single solitary penny at Bank of America? Yes. You, you did. So you never used your money. That's B. And C, this is kind of a tricky question. Do we ever have to pay back the principal, that 50000 at Chase? Do we ever have to pay them back? If you recall, when we walked in, I showed them the receipt and said, can you use this account as collateral at Bank of America, correct? Correct. So if we don't pay that 50000 back to Chase, they're just going to minus it from Bank of America, right? Right. That is the infinite banking concept. I'm using Bank of America as your banking policy. I'm talking Chase being the general fund of the insurance company. The general fund of the insurance company lends on the cash value that you deposit. The interest that you pay the general fund is less than what you're earning in dividends and interest. Mm -hmm. And if there's a loan on the policy, it gets minus from the death benefit. It's a win, win, win throughout the entire process. You're always making money because it's an asset to begin with. And it's a guaranteed, guaranteed product. Hmm. Okay, so that's the infinite banking concept. Correct. But, well, let me stop there. Justin, ask a couple of questions because then I want to go. We've got the infinite banking concept, but now I want to see how we construct that infinite banking concept, right? Yeah, I was just going to say that those those percentages are, are percentages that you would never get from the bank, by the way. Like you, you guys know that you go and put money into a savings account and you're you're getting, you know, uh, less than a than a percent sometimes uh, the, the highest that you're going to get out there is what, 3%, something like that, Joe? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I thought I saw a CD at like 4.95 for 22 months or something to that yeah. effect. And that's like, that's unheard of. Um, uh, I think, I think it's, it's important to um, uh, point out the, uh, then maybe elaborating, I think what Damon's sort of going into is how you then take this, this concept of, you know, borrowing against you're borrowing against the death benefit, right? So you're putting you're putting money into a policy, um, you, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, and then you're able to borrow that money back out pretty immediately. But you're borrowing against the death benefit, and 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 because of that, the uh, the money that you put in is still compounding as if you've left it in the account. That's that's an absolutely, right? and that would be the the companies that we use. We only use the companies at the money multiplier that checks all of the boxes for infinite banking. It needs to be a non-direct. It needs to be a mutually owned company. It needs to be a whole life policy. Just because we build it upside down and backwards doesn't mean it's not just a stupid whole life policy because it is. Not well, one person. Me, hold on, guys, because yep. Justin brought that up, but... I am almost willing to bet that there are people in this room who do not know what do you mean by policy, right? And that's what I meant by, let's look at how we construct that, right, Joe? Because you've explained the concept, right, using the bank. But now let's take that into the, the real life situation and, and right. let's talk about it from start to finish about how you construct this, right? We can do that. How about I back up one more step okay when you deposit a hundred dollars into a conventional bank bank of america your credit union chase mnt key whatever it be ten percent of that hundred dollars is class a funds that is bank funds do you know where the bank puts their class A funds first? I don't. The stock market? <laughs> into, 
Oh, hold my policy. Juan knows. In, I didn't. Into a whole life insurance policy. Did you ever see the little, I'm a vice president on everybody that works at a bank? That's mm. because they're important and they get a package. Guess what's in that package? It's a life insurance package and their beneficiary, guess what? They get $10,000, but the bank gets a million dollar life insurance policy on them. That mm. is the first place where the bank puts their class A funds. It's called Bully. Bank owned life insurance. You can Google it. How much money do banks put in life insurance? And it's going to be 189.2 ba -ba -ba billion. We are not reinventing the wheel. We are only playing follow the leader. If the if you're putting the money in the bank and the bank is using your money to do it, how about we cut out the middleman? Why don't we just teach you? how to put your money into life insurance and cut out the bank. Mm -hmm. That's all we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're just Love taking it. you right to the source. We use a traditional, stupid, whole life insurance policy built, specially designed, upside down and backwards. The traditional way is putting all of it to the base and none of it to cash value. The way that we build it is putting it the least to the base, which is the death benefit, and the most to the PUA, which is paid up additions, cash value. So if you were to put in $1,000 a month on a deposit, only 250 would be left in, and you would have access to 750 But not only that, when you went to your Bank of America on Monday and deposited $1,000, and went back to that account on Thursday and took out 500. How much would be left in your account, Damon? $500, correct? $500. But the way that we build these policies, that $1,000 that you deposit on Monday and you borrow it on Thursday, how much is left still in the account, Justin? $1,000. A thousand dollars. That is only because the general fund of the insurance company is using that account as collateral. You never touch your deposit one penny. It just keeps earning uninterrupted compounding interest until the day you stop breathing. So let me stop that there, guys. I mean, I told you he was going to bring fire, Yeah. right? I mean, unbelievable, right? If your mind's not blown at this point, I mean, I, yeah. I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know what else we can do. I don't know who else we can bring, right? So now we understand a little bit, right, about how the policy works, Joe. Um, yep. and, and I think what everybody would wonder is, okay, well, now I know how this thing works. How do I get there? Like if, if I'm just the, the normal Joe out on the street and I've, and I've heard you talk about all of this, how do I take this and make it work for me? So let me tell you, you don't need to put a lot in. All you need to do is put a little in to pay yourself first. Every penny that you put into this policy stays with you. Two months or two weeks ago, we had a little pop up at the office and we, we only had about six people there. So I like to use experiences because those help people understand the most. There was a guy and a girl standing right there and I was talking and I did my Bank of American Chase thing. and He's standing there and he's on the edge. I'm like, you don't understand it yet, do you? He says, no. Then I looked at him and he was standing there with his hands in his pocket. And I said, you got money in your pocket? He says, yeah. I says, you think you're maybe going to leave here and go get something to eat? He goes, yeah, probably. And I says, all right. So 
when the waitress comes over to the table when you're done eating and you take that $100 bill out of your pocket and you hand it to the waitress and she takes it away, how much money are you going to get back? He said, none. I said, aha. Uh -huh. Why don't you take the money in your pocket, put it into the policy, borrow it from the general fund, put that in your pocket. Now, when you take the $100 bill and hand it to the cashier, where's your money? Still in the policy? They're making uninterrupted compounding interest. Always making money on your money. And he's like, I get it now. Now I get it. I love that. I, when I do my strategy sessions with different people, I ask them, what purpose? Why are we doing this? Are we, are we paying off debt? Are we taking care of credit cards? Because then we pay the credit cards. The credit card debt lives inside of the policy. Who sees that? The policy isn't part of your credit score. It's insurance. When your debt comes off of your credit report, does not your credit score go higher? Does not your DTI go down? Does that not give you more buying power? Or can you leverage borrowing more money from the banks now? Because that debt is now living inside of the insurance policy. Not only that, but you're going to pay yourself back now. Instead of paying 21% to that credit card, you're going to recoup that 21% and pay it to yourself. Wouldn't you rather pay yourself 21% or would you rather pay Chase 21%? Mm -hmm. Okay. So how, do, how, so you, you've got the, the, the person that's going to come in and give you a call, Joe. Hey, hey, you've, you've convinced me that this is the, this is the thing to do and this is the way to go. We know that everybody's different, right? Yep. Every, every, this is as varied as, as the rainbow, but how would you tell them what are the basic steps that they would need to take to get something like this started? Every policy is specifically designed for what the individual is doing it for. One person can be doing it for debt. One person can be doing it because they want to warehouse their wealth instead of in a savings account at Bank of America making 0.001%. They can take that out of Bank of America, put it in as a dump to their policy and start making dividends and interest immediately at almost 6%, between 5 and 6%. They can use this money if nobody has any debt and they want to run it through the policy to invest. That's what I do with it. Every year, I pay an annual premium deposit, and it goes in, and I take out max loan. I take that money out, and I lend it out, and that money comes back in, and I funnel it until there's enough of money to make another opportunity to put and make more money. I just use it as a run through. I make money twice, once through my policy, once when I lend it out. You mm -hmm. can also use it as a hedge. If somebody says, well, I, I'm, I like the stock market and I, I do that options trading stuff that's far above my pay grade. I can't do options or anything like that. But uh, if they took it out of a brokerage account, they could be able to run it through the policy. Why? Because it's guaranteed to grow. And then if they lost money in the stock market, well, their money would still be in the policy grow. So you could use it as a hedge. What I want you to understand is this is not taking your money and saying, oh, do I put it in the stock market or do I put it in crypto? Or do I take my money and put it into real estate? No, no, no. This is you take your money, you put it through the policy first. And then you put it into crypto or stocks or real estate. This is an and product, not an or. People, 99%, 
think that everything we do is an or product. This is an and. You can make your money work for you twice. I really see it as like the base for your investing strategies, right? It's it's you you're you're building the foundation. It's it's something where you can store your money until the time comes, but your your money's always compounding. And so when you're um uh and and the way that Joe is explaining using it is is you know creating that base, continuing to compound your money as if it never left your 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 bank but then lending it out and earning more on top of that. So really the the 5% or 5% or that you're earning on on your your money that that is in, in uninterrupted is then only multiplied by the the interest rates that you're making on whatever private money lending you're doing. Exactly. So yeah. let's 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 say 100,000. So we're going to deposit 100,000 at 6%. Let's say you borrow that same 100,000 out at 4.8%. Let's call it 5% just for the sake of argument. At the end of the year, don't you have to pay back $5,000 for using the money? But I just said 6% is what we're making with dividends and interest. So not only is the insurance company paying the 5% for the borrow, they're giving you $1,000 for doing it, saying thank you, little pat on the back for doing it. It's an asset right from the get-go. It's an asset. Amazing. So, so, okay, Joe. Yep. I, now I'm coming to you and, and now I, I want to get this going and, and guys, I want to leave tons of time at the end for questions because I'm There's imagining that, that <laughs> folks are coming hot with a lot of questions, right? Yeah. Uh, if you're not, that's your fault, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so okay, now I'm coming to you. I want to set this up and I remember you talking to me about a trust and uh, you know, having a, um, a Wyoming holding company and explain some of that structure, how you set that up and, and the tax deduction and All right. Well, now we're going to climb up the ladder a couple more rungs and let's say that uh, you're an entrepreneur, you're a real estate person and uh you have uh, lending, you, so, so you're a private money lender and, and your income is coming in and you're at, you know, 200, 300,000, whatever. And your, your, uh, your rate that you're paying to the federal government is, is over 50 to $60,000 taxable to the, to the government to pay. Well, now that will kind of put you into a different realm of tax status. So what everybody's used to is paying a 1040. So a 1040 is, you know, what we pay on a schedule C, or if you're lending money and you get a 1099, that goes on schedule B, or if you're doing real estate and you put that on a schedule C. So once you achieve uh, the goal of paying $100,000 in taxes, that kind of puts you into a new realm. And that's called the 1041 tax structure. So that's where the LLC is set up as a partnership. That partnership would be a K-1 to you, which would be your social security and your, your 1040, and a business trust, which is set up as you are the trustee, but a separate EIN. So technically the LLC partnership is a partnership between you and you. All the money that comes into the LLC will be allocated to the business trust. Now the business trust can own real estate. It can lend money. It can, it can do anything like that. And then the beneficiary of the business trust would be the family trust. That's where you would put in your house or your second house or, you know, that kind of stuff. And then the money would be allocated because this is all a flow through all the way through and any monies that didn't get allocated out of that, the beneficiary of the family trust is now the private foundation, the 501c3. Now all of these have to be set up correctly. They have to be a, a non-grantor, uh, spin-thrift, irrevocable. They all have to be set up correctly. So I'm not, uh, that's how I use it. You know, I'm, I'm not the CPA guy, but 
I have one. I've been doing it for four years and I allocate all my monies to run through this and it serves as asset protection and tax minimization because anything that I don't use personally that goes to a K1 to my 1040 stays on the 1041 side and it gets allocated and donated to the foundation. So that's another way for tax minimization. And, and guys, like as you get this, you're climbing the ladder, right? We're, we're starting at the bottom. We got to always start at the bottom and work our way up. But as you work your way up, right, it, it just shows that somebody like Joe, um, great guy, is here to help you, right, along the way. So um, again, don't reinvent the wheel. He's done it all. He knows, he knows what you need to do. So, Justin, do you have any other questions that you might like to ask or talk about? Because I would like to open up the room so that yeah. Joe can, can ask, you know, answer. I think some I think there's a lot of questions in the room, so I, I would I would uh, just go ahead and and um, and have everyone raise their hands and come in and and ask questions um, mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah, yeah. So, guys, please uh, raise your hands. Uh, you just. Uh, Raise your hand, uh, and and Lance or or Juan will open you guys up, you know, one by one uh, to ask ask your questions. Don't be shy. Come on in. I see tons of questions. Uh, Chris Wheatley, Don Horton, all of these guys are asking questions. Hey. Um, we would love for you guys to come in and uh, ask Joe questions. So please feel free. Open up. Let's ask some questions. Anybody Get on it, guys. I ha I can ask one while we're waiting. I got one. Um, you put folks on the spot, and then they don't want to. Ask I know. Questions. No, it does. This happens every week. <laughs> there we go, Heath. There we go, Heath. There he is. Come Heath. on down. You're the oh, next contestant. I, I always have questions. I always have questions. Love that. All right. Um, now, I, I would suspect that this is going to vary by um, by provider. But if we look at this in the context of you're putting your money into a bucket, right? Um, and the the policy represents the bucket. You have your individual contributions coming in, and then when you before you even um, before you even take out a loan and start incurring cost that bucket is going to have a, a hole in it that's going to leak out by way of, by means of policy premiums, right? Um, so what is the, what's the magnitude of that impact relative to um, the, the benefits that are being offset by those interest gains? So you're thinking of a traditional whole life and you're thinking about everything going to death benefit. I told you that these are built specifically designed upside down and backwards. Only okay. the minimum will go to the death benefit, approximately 20 to 25% of what the deposit is. So on a thousand dollar deposit, 250 goes to the base, 750 goes to the borrow. So on a $12,000 a year deposit, in the first year, you have access to approximately 8,500 of that 12,000. In year two, you have access to 9,000 of that 12,000. In year three, you have access to 11,000 of that 12,000. And in year four, you actually have 12,200 available on that 12,000. Usually with our clients, somewhere between second year to our fifth year. So, I mean, it's quite a big spectrum depending on all of our numbers and our health and, and everything that goes into it, right? Because this is a life insurance policy. You do have to qualify health and, and different ratings, you know. Um, so everything has, you know, aptitude for it. But the PUA also drops off in year eleven. So you only go back to the base. And as you know, that base at 250 is 3,000. Do you know what the cash on cash is in year 11 with a deposit of 3,000? How about seven? 
Hmm. Almost two and a half percent cash on cash. That is because we overfunded in the beginning and let it ride for 10 years. And then we stopped the PUA. It's like a rocket ship going into the space with the boosters. The boosters fall off and now the rocket ship has enough oomph to keep it going through space. That's all we're doing with the policy. We're pre-funding it. We're building it for you, for your purpose and what it's designed to do. So so there's a maximum amount of contributions that can be made per year into each policy, right? Absolutely. Yeah. There is approximately 20 to 25% of your annual income. That is the most that you can contribute because okay. of the MEC rule, the modified endowment contract. Back in the 70s, all the millionaires and billionaires were taking money and stuffing it inside insurance policies. And the IRS says, Oh my goodness, we're not getting taxed. We, we, we're not, we, we don't get any of this money. They're putting it into an insurance policies and we know that insurance policies grow tax-free with a beneficiary that doesn't pay any taxes on it, right? Yeah. Well, we need to do some kind of stipulation. So that's where they made the modified endowment contract. So therefore, all of our numbers have to fit inside this special little box. So when you call me up and you say what we're doing and how much you want to put in, there's you can also put in the dump too. That's just a one time. So if you wanted to move your money from Bank of America to the Bank of John, if you will, that would be a one time event. That's when we move it from our left pocket to our right pocket. And then so, we base the policy in regards to that too. So is that maximum contribution per individual, per entity, per household, which... So in other you can, words, you cannot over insure your house. You cannot over insure your car. You cannot over insure your body. As much death benefit as your body is allotted is how much you can do. Well, you said 25% I, I'm on the, a, the cap. of your annual income. So, so my question is, um, if I established a policy for myself, right? Yep. It's done I, on your body at, at 25%. Yep. Right. Of my mm -hmm. income. Yep. Um, my wife does not, I may be going down a rabbit hole here. So no, go ahead, ask but, the question. Um, so my wife is a homemaker, right? So she's a lot of three quarters of your death no, benefit. Right. She has no income. However, yeah. if she were to establish a policy um yeah. for her, right, and I were to gift part of my income to her. You don't How gift it. You, you don't gift it. It's done do by that. yours. You get three quarters. She gets three. She's allotted three quarters of your death benefit. Okay. There's already rules and stipulations. Same thing with kids. Same thing with any kids that are underneath 18. They're allotted okay. half of the greater of the parent, 50%, up to a million dollars. Okay. Yep. It's all stipulated. You don't have to gift or anything like that. They just see that, okay, well, um, Heath, Keith has a $1 million death benefit. So now your wife can get 750. We would say, okay, 750 is wrote at, at for, for a 53 year old female. How much deposit do we have to put in and how are we gonna break that up? Without exceeding that 25%. Nope, that 25% doesn't account for her, only for you. Okay. I already that, yeah, that was my, yeah, of your that, death benefit. yeah, that was my question. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, it, 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 as far as a company um, through a business, if you have, can these be used as key man policies? Absolutely. But, but you could only you're it's still the same same rule would apply, right? You can only insure an individual. Uh, now I'm really going down a rabbit hole, so that's probably something I should. Uh, just we'll do a strategy do a console. Call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, absolutely, key man. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. Oh, thanks. Anyone else, yeah. guys? Other questions, guys? I can't believe that other people don't. I have mean, questions. they're going nuts. They're going um, nuts in the chats here. We got, up, we've got, we've got other up professionals. The chat and nobody's asking. Yeah, nobody's asking questions. Everybody's a pro, and nobody's a question. Yeah, asker. exactly. Um, Lance, do you yeah. want to go through and ask some questions out of the chat? Yeah, let's do that. I was thinking that too earlier. Uh, I was just I was just opening up the chat myself. Yeah. Yeah, there's all yeah. kinds of stuff going on here. 
Um, so do you have to repay what you take out? Uh, yes or no, or write out um, or no. Okay, so as I explained, you're only bringing in and putting in the amount of money to the policy until the next opportunity. You understand that money not in motion is not making money. So therefore, we teach you, I teach you how to keep moving your money. So if you borrowed $100,000 and put that out to make money, to make lending, and that brings you in $1,000 a month, what is the next opportunity? You're going to keep putting that $1,000 a month in until maybe you acquire another 15 or 20. And then what? Then you're going to take that 15 or 20. You're going to put that into the next opportunity to make more money. Now you have two income streams coming in. I hope I answered that correctly. Yeah, and so, so you don't have to pay it back technically. Well, I mean, it's it's not like a mortgage. This this is this is different. This is banking. We're turning you into a bank. Let me let me say this. Okay, here. Let me give you another example. So if you have a thousand dollars and you walk into the bank at Bank of America and you stand in line, you walk up to the teller and you hand them a thousand dollars. Do they take that thousand dollars, put it in a little box? and put Joe on it and put it in the corner and say, oh, Joe's gonna be back next week for that? No, they put it in the till. They say, okay, deposit of $1,000. Well, mm -hmm. Lance comes in behind me and he says, I need $500. Well, they just went into the till and took my thousand and handed it to Lance at $500. That's the movement of money. If money isn't moving, money isn't making money. Uh, you know, that's that's the key part to this entire banking system and why we're doing it. We're teaching money. you to become the bank. Mm -hmm. Love it. That makes by sense. Way, by the way, Wayne Moniz, you said that you're confused. Brother, you got to raise your hand. The stupidest questions are the ones that you don't ask, guys. <laughs> that's right. We do have two others. Uh Raise your hand, brother. Raise your hand. Jack. Because I'm sure he can clarify for you. Jack. Jack turn your Johnson. Camera on, man. Come on turn up, brother. Hey folks. Uh quick question for you. So let's say you get you got one of these policies set up, but you were kind of worried about making a big premium every year. So you got a small policy. And then you realize, okay, my policy's too small. What yep. do you guys recommend then? Do you recommend just getting a bigger policy, a new bigger policy, or is there something you could do with that smaller policy to grow it? You cannot do anything with that smaller policy because it's okay. maxed out at whatever you decided to put in. So, you know, the minimum would be 10 times your age. So people coming in say, I just want to dip my toes in. Okay, let's get a $300 policy. Well, after they said, well, I, I put in $300 a month in, but I'm only going to use 200. What am I going to use 200 for? Exactly. So you are not at optimum usage for that policy. We could have a strategy call and say, okay, now that you have this policy, what are your next goals? What are you doing next? We could get a bigger policy and it's called structuring. You're going to deposit money into this policy, take it out and pay the little policy and keep it rolling because now it's an asset. Now you have two assets, the leftover mm -hmm. money can be put into a bigger pot and we can grow it and get another policy. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I answered I, your question, right? Yeah, I love the yeah, question. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Guys, I, I love the questions because it helps even all of us, right? Me, everyone in the room to help to clarify. Uh, Jack, I didn't think about that, right? I mean, that's a, that's a really great thing that he brought up. Well, some some people start off a, a little bit like now you asked me you know in the beginning like who who is for this i actually had a client two years ago 18 years old and he was an uber driver and he said that he only made like ten thousand dollars a year and he wanted to put in 300 bucks a month i said that's fabulous this is so cool oh my goodness i'm so proud of you he says i watched the video and i want to do it my, my parents don't understand what i'm doing can you help me out? Well, that's my little buddy. And I says, absolutely. So after about three, four months, he calls me up and he says, Joe, I, I did extra and, and I have enough money to 
fund my policy till the end of the year? Is there a way that I can put the money in and take it right back out? I said, absolutely. And we got a hold of the insurance company and he funded his policy. And he said, and then three months later, he says, I'm going to work harder and I'm going to change it into an annual payment. Well, he certainly did. So then three months later, four months later, he saved up enough a month money for the 3600 and now he has an annual payment so now when he puts in the 36 he's going to take out that 32 right away and then he's gonna and now he, he also got his real estate license and he's putting it in and he's doing uh um sub two and and he's growing and he's <laughs> he's he's doing awesome and he called me up about two months ago and he says i think i'm ready for another policy and i says not yet fund this one for the full year, save it up, and then we can grow. See, because I don't want you to do too much either. I I want I always err on the side of caution. If somebody says, Oh, I want to put this I'm much in. Time. If somebody says, I want to put this much in and guys, turn your mic off, please. <laughs> pansy. It's pansy. I apologize. My grandson's got to hold okay. my phone. Turn your mic off. Thank you, guys. That's okay. If, 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 if somebody is like on the edge, I mean, I, I granted, I, I help them, right? So I, I see how much money they're saving per month and I see how much money can be put in. And then we utilize that structure and then build off of that. So if, if somebody says to me, okay, um, I'm saving, I'm saving $500 a month, right? And they, they make, uh, a hundred thousand a year, just for round numbers. I'm like, all right, well, you're saving 500 a month. So that's the amount of money that you can leave in the policy and it won't affect your food, your livelihood, your bills. That's what you're saving, right? Absolutely. So 500 is 25% of the entire policy. So if 500 is 25%, that means that they can put in $2,000. Because what's 25% of 100,000? 2,000 a month. So they can leave in 500, put in the 15, borrow it back out, pay their credit cards, recoup it, pay themselves back, grow, and that's how we do it. Hmm. I love that. Uh, Heath, you got another question. Can I, can I just jump in really quick before you, yeah, before yeah. you do that? Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, one of the things that everyone should really keep in mind here is that Joe is a money mentor in a lot of ways. Like he wants to help you guys. He wants to um, celebrate your wins and help you get to a point. Uh, I know there are people out there that will just set up these policies for you, but he's going to tailor them specifically to you. Um, and he's going to make sure that you're not going over, you know, spending too much on the policy and not being able to make it ends meet other places. And he's going to teach you these systems and processes to put into place. And that's what really sets him apart, I think, from from other um, people who do this. So. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add to that. So I've been working with Joe as well. And I'm actually really glad I had actually started working with a money multiplier before I met Joe. And then and then Justin saw me wearing this hat. And he's like, oh, my gosh, I did not know you were part of the money multiplier. You got to talk to this guy, Joe. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad I did. So I got with Joe. Joe actually, you know, he treats me like family. He actually got upset at me for sending an email instead of calling him or texting him. He's like, bro, you got my number. Call <laughs> me, text me, and I'll answer your questions. Like, you know, that's that's how accessible Joe makes himself to you guys. So definitely would recommend him. Uh, to you guys to answer your questions and really like like Justin just said, st strategize with you to to optimize your specific situation. For sure, not, and, not everybody is add, the same. Let me add to that one. Like guys, if if you're in the sub two community, right, you know how Pace is a mentor to you, right? Pace is showing you how to do these things. Joe is a mentor to you. He is wanting to show you and steer you how to do these things, right? He's not, this is not just a one-time deal that we're offering here, guys. Um, we're gonna offer here at the end, the ability to get in contact with Joe. Uh, he wants you to come in and he's opened up his calendar for a week. He's gonna want you to come in and fill up his calendar and have that conversation with him um, so that you guys can figure out how to tailor this and make it work for you, right? Um, Keith, 
let's bring in and ask one last question. Um, and then guys, we're going to head out by giving because we want to respect Joe's time. He's a busy guy. And uh, we, we're going to give you all of the ways to get in touch with him and um, you know, make sure that everybody is, is, is able to get in contact with Joe. Go ahead. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so relative to funding the account, um, number one, is it advantageous to roll over some other type of investment vehicle like a like IRA or 401k assets into one of these accounts? And if so, um, hmm. will it outside of a Roth um, trigger a taxable event? Or is that, I mean, that may be something that you would need to refer me to a CPA, but is there a way to fund it that way without? Nope. Okay. Nope, because the money that you contribute to a life insurance policy is already taxed. So therefore, okay. if you take the money out of a 401k, you're going to pay taxes on it or the penalty if you're not 59 and a half. I also have a different vehicle. If it's not an active 401k or an IRA, I can also direct okay. you into a custodian and we can turn that into a self-directed IRA. A true self-directed IRA means that you can purchase a cow, milk the cow, take the milk to the street, take the milk, the money from the milk and put it back into the policy. So we're not talking about any, <laughs> any self-directed that, you know, uh, here, let's see, and a Merrill Lynch or something like that has. Because about two months ago, I had a kid call me up and say, hey, I see you have a self-directed IRA. I says, how do you know I have a self-directed IRA? Back about 15 years ago, I opened up a $5,000 IRA, forgot all about it. And he called me up and I'm like, hey, can you send me information on that? Well, he said I had a self-directed. And I says, really? Can I buy a cow? And he starts laughing. I'm like, listen, you don't know your ass from a hole in the ground. It's not a self-directed because you're telling me what I can put it in and what I can't put it in. This mm. is a self-directed with a custodian. It's called Horizon Trust. Google it and then you'll know. And I hung up on him. Hmm. <laughs> and and uh, just a, awesome. a, a alert here, guys. Pace put out Horizon Trust. We're hearing it again, right? Um, yeah, and I've heard it all. I've heard it all over the place at conferences that I've gone Horizon. to. Horizon Trust is the spot to go to. That's I'm. I deal with Horizon Trust. They have yeah. my old four hundred one k from the railroad. Yeah. Yep. Okay, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna open this up one last time, guys. Any questions, Wayne? Are you still confused, my friend? Come in and ask the questions, man. Don't be nervous. You know, a lot of a lot of a lot of the stuff that I was confused on did get answered, like multiple policies and everything. So awesome. Awesome. Nice guys. We really do try to bring the best available content out there. Joe has been gracious enough. Um, I, I just can't thank him enough for coming in and talking with all of us. So this is an opportunity that I want to give Joe to put out to everybody. Joe, how can these folks get in contact with you? Um, you know, a calendar, if you want to put your link, um, Instagram, Facebook, any, any of those avenues? Yeah. Is there, I sent I've, it to Justin. I've once. been, I've been posting that in the chat throughout the, okay. throughout the call today. There's probably about four or five different links. Um, it's the same link. So I just put it in there now. Um, if you want to call with Joe, just click, click on this now so that you have it saved because you know once we close this, um, you won't be have you won't have access to it. Right. We'll we'll also we'll also put it on the replay, you know, in the description and everything. So um and, and if if everybody if anybody does, you know, loses the link, just come and ask and we'll 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 provide it for you. Yeah. And uh I've already booked my call. That's the that's the keys to running the podcast, man. I got it. There. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, guys, as always, um, respecting Joe's time, man, Joe, I'm, I really honestly am uh, so thankful of you for coming on and giving your time. As I tell everyone, um, I've been so lucky, man, along the way to have people that were willing to pour into me. Um, mm. You know, going from being a homeless vet to where I am now, I, I just, I feel so blessed, man, to have people like you around me. And they were willing to give time. Time is the most valuable thing on earth that we have. 
And when people are willing to give that to you, you should take stop and, and really uh, listen, right? So Joe, I appreciate you for your time, man. Thank you. I appreciate yes. being here and all of you. And I hope to speak to some of you and do a strategy call and hopefully help you climb the ladder a couple rungs. Uh, and uh, it would be my honor to assist you. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, right, Joe. Guys. You got a couple of people. Early, but a phone call. You guys take don't forget, next... guys. Don't forget to go follow, subscribe, and like the Creative Collective REI Think Tank on YouTube. Oh Man, Lance, Bro. Thank you for bringing Bro. that up. What am I, I doing? I put it in the chat. I'm, I'm, I did put it in I'm the so chat. I'm so excited <laughs> from the podcast today that I completely I forgot. Guys. <laughs> Please, 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 man. As Lance said, I beg you, please go out, like our YouTube, there like it our is. Facebook, Instagrams, um, all of yeah. it. Um, get on those interwebs and let people know who we are. The more that we grow, the bigger guests and the more guests that we can bring on. And all we want is to bring value to this community yep. um, and show you guys entrepreneurs that are doing it in a different way right because uh, that's how we do it we learn from uh, we learn from each other so yeah please guys go like our instagram facebook snapchat get on those interwebs and make it happen all right guys we love you all thanks so much for coming L love to have roberto good night thanks guys <laughs> thanks guys, right, thanks, guys. guys. <laughs> thank you bye, bye.